have you here for our information session for the University of Chicago Master of Liberal Arts. As you join the room, uh, let me just offer a couple of housekeeping notes. Uh, first, uh, you are already role models in having your screens on. It's something that we encourage in the program and something that we encourage in our information sessions. We try to have these regularly and keep them small for the purpose of truly having interactivity. And so uh, visual is just one of those ways of interacting. And as we come toward the second part of the information session, we'll also be encouraging your direct questions or your chatting in your questions. So uh, we see you and we look forward to hearing you in a little bit. Uh, and then I do want to note that this webinar is recorded. Um, a lot of the people who register uh, ask for the video uh, because they can't make the live time. And so we found that to be a really useful way to ensure that it's accessible. And so we hope that you're all comfortable with that and uh, just wanted to make sure that we're respecting your knowledge of the recording. Uh, well, let me get started. Uh, it is a wonderful day at the University of Chicago, although I will say at this moment, as many of you may know, it is a little bit hazier uh, than it appears here uh, because our climate is under change as is well known across many divisions in our university. Uh, but the reason that we like to start with this photo is because it does represent the place where the big ideas of this university are emanating from. And even though this is a primarily online program with a residential seminar opportunity, uh, this place is very special. And you will regularly hear about Hyde Park, feel Hyde Park, and know the intellectual culture that comes from this setting in everything that we do. Uh, so I will just give you a quick roadmap of what we're going to be journeying through in the next hour. Uh, we will be having a brief welcome. We're then going to hear a snapshot of the Master of Liberal Arts. We're going to talk specifically about the how, the learning journey. And then I'll turn it over to my colleague to talk about timeline and details. And most importantly, we'll come to your questions. And so starting with that welcome, I'll begin by sharing that I'm Seth Green. And on an evening like this one, I'm especially grateful and proud to say that I'm the Dean of the University of Chicago's Graham School. And the jewel of our school is the Master of Liberal Arts. And I will turn it over to my colleague, Tim Murphy, uh, to talk a little bit about himself. Tim, who are you and what's your role? Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Tim Murphy, and uh, as Seth mentioned, I serve as the program director of the Master of Liberal Arts program. Uh, I've been with the Graham School for uh, almost eight years now, and I, I've worked with the MLA that entire time. Uh, and uh, that longevity is, is a result of uh, I, uh, my sharing of Seth's sentiment that the MLA is uh, the jewel of, uh, of the Graham School. Uh, prior to joining Graham, I was uh, a student at UChicago. I, I did my undergraduate here. Uh, and took a master's a, a few years after that uh, in American history. Um, and so I, I might have a special insight when I, I say that uh, from where I sit, I, I think that the MLA offers uh, and represents really the, uh, the best of what a UChicago uh, education ought to be. Uh, and so I'm, I'm excited to um, get into some of those details uh, here shortly. Wonderful. Uh, we have a student among us. Uh, Beth has been a student in the Master of Liberal Arts and is about halfway through, if I recall, uh, our conversation correctly. And so do you want to just share a little bit about yourself and your world outside of being a student? Sure, absolutely. Um, yeah, as, as Seth mentioned, I um, am, have been in the ML program since September, and I'm about halfway through it. Um, out, outside, I um, started my, you know, I have a background in journalism and then an MBA from an education standpoint, but have worked in uh, across industries from real estate, education, technology, um, leading investor relations practices and serving as uh, chief of staff and uh, chief administrative officer for a number of companies. So uh, a business background and um, have found, uh, a, which we'll talk about later, a good connection and how that's helped me uh, even be a better leader. So it's helped in that sense. But that's my Wonderful. background. Thank you so much, Beth. And our final introduction, our director of recruitment, Carrie Dempsey. 
that said, I'm Carrie, and I'm director of recruitment here for the MLA program. Um, I am a, a newer addition to the Graham team. I joined at the beginning of this calendar year, and um, I came over to Graham School because I'm really, I'm just truly passionate about a liberal arts education. I feel it nurtures a broader way of thinking that's critical in both our personal and professional lives. And I love that every day I have the opportunity to serve as a bit of a bridge helping new learners find our program. Well, you will hear from everyone over the course of this conversation, uh, but I will move us into the MLA snapshot and I will start by offering a bit of an overview and then turn to Beth and Tim to give much more tangibility given their roles and depth. Uh, so let me start by saying why we have a Master of Liberal Arts. Um, I assume you already caught that this is an advanced studies in the liberal arts. But why we use the liberal arts is because we really believe that it remains the way for individuals to deeply understand themselves, society, and how they can interact in the context of their professional and personal life. And so what we hope is that by, for example, reading great books across time and space, looking at the latest advances in the sciences and going deep into research in the social sciences and areas as far afield as behavioral economics and how to think about new evolutions, what we can ultimately do is help people to become better leaders, better problem solvers, and better communicators. And that that process of taking immense amounts of information across time and space and across disciplines and being able to really figure out what matters and how to make the strongest argument that that is a leadership skill and a problem solving skill and a communication skill that will serve you in any walk of life and across all areas of what you may want to achieve. And the result of that orientation is that this is a degree that is especially focus, and I'll talk about this uh, in a moment, on people that have often two or three decades of experience and are looking for that opportunity to really have a boot camp to really re-energize their mind and sharpen their skill set. Uh, we are in this transformative education in a transforming world. And one of the reasons that we're so passionate about this form of graduate education at the University of Chicago is that most of the technical skills are changing rapidly. So if we look at what's happening with artificial intelligence, with the many ways that we right now in Chicago are experiencing change in our climate, what we're seeing is a rapidly changing environment around us. And what we believe is that increasingly, it will not be the just technical skill that you have maybe to code or to look at a finance document, but the combination of that with the ability to think deeply, creatively, and innovatively, and that what separates us, for example, from the AI pattern recognition is the ability to come up with novel thought and actually exercise that in new ways. And being in a setting that is as transformative as the university really does allow you, when you're across all these disciplines, to really hone those muscles that will then go on to fuel your personal and professional growth. And so I'll just share that as we've thought about the kind of three outcomes of this degree, we think about sharpening your literal toolkit, synthetic thinking, meaning the ability to take a lot of information and synthesize it, critical thinking, writing, presenting and adaptive leadership are one domain. A second is that you have the opportunity, and we'll talk about this in the learning journey, to specialize within the Master of Liberal Arts and to have a focus that could specifically expand your expertise, for example, in ethics and leadership, or a new concentration just introduced because of the number of tech entrepreneurs that have come into the degree that have been asking for more at this intersection of tech and society is a whole new concentration that allows you to really look at the why that is so undiscovered as we are moving quickly forward in the what of technology. And then most importantly for many people, you join a community and that community is of peers that are also accomplished and that are looking forward 
to thinking about how they use their intellectual talents to really drive impact in the world. And so I'll just mention one more detail before we come to talking with uh, Tim and Beth, uh, who this is for. Uh, we find that while every MLA student has a distinct story, there are some common attributes. One is that this is a group of individuals that typically love intellectual journey and are looking for an opportunity to be deep in inquiry with others. A second is that this is a group that is often already with a significant level of education and accomplishment. So a strong majority have a graduate degree already, often in an area like an MBA or an MD or a JD. And what they're really looking to do often 20 years after that degree is think about how do I now take this to another level and think about this in a complex organization or in a complex system. Uh, many have executive leadership roles uh, and then you see the average years of professional experience. And most importantly for us is what attributes our students across the university and especially in the MLA bring. That this is a degree for people that are deeply curious, that want to investigate the world that want to do that in a rigorous way and that want to do it in a way that is both innovative and collaborative. Uh, so that is a lot of description conceptually. But the reason that we have these information sessions most of all, because much of that you can probably see on the website, is that we want to do this in discussion with people that are actually both in the degree itself and who are right alongside them. And so I'm gonna take down my screen for a moment uh, because I wanted to bring in Tim and Beth. And Beth, I'm gonna start with you. Um, can you talk about why you chose to pursue the Master of Liberal Arts and how you see it complementing your existing MBA? Absolutely. And I and the, your description actually was really spot on. I mean, I couldn't have said it better of, of, of how it's fit to my life. Um, the reason, and it's similar to when I went back and got my MBA, is it, it has changed. I was looking for the opportunity to expand my thinking, um, and it has done that. Like I've said, I'm about halfway through, and it expand just changing my perspective on how I see the world, um, especially in this day and age when the work worlds are so um, just turbulent is one word, but just a lot of change and a lot happening, and the ability to to really, to think differently. Um, and I think the, one of the words that you had on your list was curiosity, um, innovation, collaboration. And one of the things that this program does, and you know, as I made the decision to do, to think about it is, is, is how to look at the world differently and outside my box of perspective. So broadening that and, and from a, you know, I'm in the uh, leadership and ethics concentration. Um, and how, how can I be a more courageous, you know, you know, working with people and, and leadership standpoint. And, and that's what this has done. I mean, that's the same thing, you know, when I got my MBA, which was many, many years ago, it was life changing. It changed the way, I mean, it was new language, but it was also more importantly, new thinking. And I can, and as we get more into the, some, the, the conversation about, you know, how it's structured, I can even get more specifics of how, you know, how I had to kind of jump in there and, and actually, you know, be uncomfortable for a while while I was doing that or still, still do. Well, and I'd love to build on that, Beth, because Tim, you've seen hundreds of students in the Master of Liberal Arts. And so, you know, we hear from Beth this example of how it's really helping her to develop her ethical leadership. Um, talk about why you see others uh, pursue the MLA and how you've seen it impact them. Uh, sure. So I think it'll be uh, most helpful to address that question by um, talking about uh, different common categories of students uh, that we have and sort of maybe the motivations for pursuing it. Uh, so the first category I would point to is uh, leaders in tech, and you referenced this a little bit earlier. Uh, this group comes first to mind because I think it's the, uh, if it's not the fastest, it's certainly a rapidly growing segment of our student body. Um, and I'm, I'm thinking, for example, of one of our students who is the chief uh, technology officer for the Dallas branch of the Federal Reserve, um, or another student in, the pro, uh, in our program who is uh, program head for uh, the international tech consulting firm Wipro. Uh, so students like these tell us that 
in their day jobs, they're no longer doing coding or otherwise involved in uh, the minutia of the technology they work with. Uh, instead, as leaders in, uh, in their field, uh, their roles require them to think critically and to think ethically about their company's mission uh, and the implications that technologies have on their client uh, and on society writ large. Um, I think they feel that they've mastered the how of technology, uh, but they tell us in like their candidate statements in their application that they're pursuing the MLA uh, to acquire a new perspective uh, on their work and to gain critical thinking skills and ethical frameworks that uh, enable them to consider bigger questions, the the, uh, the why questions uh, of technology. So that's one bucket. Uh, another uh, bucket is business leaders, and this is going to echo much of uh, uh, best excellent response. Uh, but they're another large segment of our student body. Uh, they're made up of accomplished executives and, and business leaders uh, who come to the program for that cognitive boot camp that Seth referenced earlier. Uh, we have a student uh, who prior to joining the program had served in a variety of uh, director level positions uh, in the pharmaceutical industry on the East Coast for companies like Johnson & Johnson and Catalent uh, Pharma. Pharma. Uh, so he's here to hone his critical thinking skills and sharpen his ability uh, to see the, the big picture. Um, and uh, just the final one that I'll throw out is uh, people who work in uh, communication roles. Uh, so this uh, is admittedly a bit of a, a catch-all grouping uh, for students who work in fields uh, as diverse as marketing, publishing, and strategic communications. Uh, another one of our current students is, um, is an uh, investigative reporter for the Chicago Tribune. Uh, so these types of students, unsurprisingly, are strong writers, uh, but they're seeking to further hone their craft by writing in different subject areas uh, across our interdisciplinary curriculum, uh, and also uh, hone their writing through guided reading uh, of some of the masterpieces of the, the human literary tradition um, both of which they'll receive an ample measure uh, in the MLA program. Well, those are great examples. And I want to now double click, Beth, on your example, uh, because you have over your professional career been in a lot of C-suite executive roles, as well as now in your consulting work, you're advising a lot of executives. And I'm curious, as someone who kind of has seen it from that angle and now is in the ethics and leadership concentration, how have you seen the MLA courses help you think about leadership? And I mean, more broadly, if I can, why do you see the liberal arts education as valuable as a, a leadership tool? I mean, you've had an MBA, you've had these other examples of kind of leadership development. Why the, the liberal arts as, you know, yeah. an additional way to get there? A couple, thi a couple things, um, and then adding on to what to Kim, Tim said too, is that is it's it's helped me uh, question, and I think I mean, as a leader, I think that's really important. Or when you're working with people, or just in when you're existing in the world as well, but to question your thinking. Yeah. Um, I think we sometimes uh, at certain times in your life, you you get stuck in you know that you know what you're you get you know you, I I know what I'm, I've been in this world, I understand it, but you realize that there's stuff you don't know, um, and. And it makes you instead of, and this is, and I, I have, I have a journalism undergrad, and then I went and got my MBA much, you know, sometime later, and then worked, have worked in, as, as you mentioned, in different, different worlds, different industries, but I never had like the Socratic approach. That wasn't a something that you did do an MBA. You're, you know, you're doing an operations class or doing a cash flow, whatever, but you don't. It's, it's really pushing you to think, go outside your comfort zone. I mean, I, you know, I, one of my first, my first class I took was some versions of the apocalypse, which is, you know, not something I work on an everyday basis, but then I took a leadership class and I just recently did an AI residential program. And it, you have to not just, when you answer something, when you're in this group of folks, if we'll talk about that at some point, who's in, you know, your other, other, um, your peers in the classroom and your professors is you can't just say, oh, this is the answer. You have to think. And that was one of the things that I had to get comfortable with is, you know, you're used to being in a, a work environment where you sometimes know the answer, you know, you've done it for a while. So you're, you're comfortable in that sense. But this is really an example where you have to, to, to step out of that comfort zone and think and really go deeper. And you go in depth and you, you know, as Tim mentioned, or Seth mentioned about deep reading or, you know, writing. And that's, that's another thing. It just, you're, you're, you're a, a better thinker. And that's really, that's served me well in the program. And then also my peers, and then I can talk to the professors as well, but you know, you just learn from everybody. They're so smart and so accomplished and, and so supportive 
I mean, it's yeah. such a, it's in the classes, which I think we'll talk about a little bit the structure, but the way the class structure is, you just really feel, um, it, you, you can feel yourself growing from the beginning of the class to the each end. So good, good experience in that sense. Well, and Tim, just to take this broader lens again, as someone who sees across our students, um, how have you seen individuals grow in the MLA? So uh, my initial response to that would be to speak to the confidence uh, students gain. Uh, as we mentioned a few times now, many of our students already uh, have achieved professional, a noteworthy professional accomplishment, uh, but many of them have been away from school for a while. Uh, and it can be intimidating to have your re-entry into academic life be at a place like U Chicago. Uh, so it's rewarding from my perspective to see students in the beginning of their MLA journey who are like a little nervous about enrolling in their first class in poetry or, li or literature, um, only to see them thrive in that class and their subsequent, subsequent classes. Uh, and then those students are the first ones to sign up for a neuroscience course uh, two or three quarters down the road. Uh, but so, so confidence is, is the first uh, first thing I, I would speak to, but I'll give you a more concrete example that uh, springs to mind as well. Uh, we have a profile uh, on our website of a recent alum named Omer Imtiaz. Uh, he's a director at PricewaterhouseCooper, uh, and he's he generously credits the MLA uh, for uh, helping in part for him landing that role. Uh, and prior to the MLA, he had a very technical skill set. Uh, his background was computer programming. And he talks about how his MLA education uh, opened up new opportunities for him because it so dramatically improved his uh, critical thinking and communication skills. So at, at PwC, he often finds himself uh, in, he refers to as sort of this translator role uh, between his clients uh, and them expressing what their needs are and then his team of analysts and consultants who are gonna try and, uh, and deliver for those clients. So those two camps, uh, they think in very different ways and they speak in very different terms. Uh, and Omer credits the interdisciplinary MLA curriculum with helping him be comfortable in those different settings, uh, which ensure that uh, his team of specialists will provide the best service to the clients, uh, which is especially important when uh, the clients don't always articulate their needs uh, in the terms that his analysts use. Well, great examples. I am going to now bring us back into the PowerPoint because we're going to move from our why in terms of the MLA into the how, the learning journey. And my aim, because I noticed the time, is to go through this in about five minutes uh, and then come back, Beth and Tim, to you to really give tangibility to it so that we make sure to leave at least 20 minutes here for Q&A with all of you as our audience. And so let me start with the literal curriculum so you can see the roadmap or learning journey that you would be on in the Master of Liberal Arts. Uh, we consider this to be the jewel of the university because it is the one degree, whereas you see in the maroon, you actually get to be part of every division of this university. You take a class in the humanities and the social sciences and the biological sciences and the physical sciences. And especially for individuals, which I know many of you are, who are at a level of accomplishment or are in roles that have complexity, you are probably interacting with all four of these disciplines on a weekly, if not daily basis. And so it really allows you to be at the forefront of major ideas across the divisions of a great university like ours. Uh, and then you have the opportunity to peek in to areas that interest you through your electives, including one elective that needs to be on a topic that is non-Western uh, to ensure that it reflects the diversity of experiences. Uh, because earlier on, we saw that there was not always that push to look at Eastern thought or other examples. And so we wanted to make sure that that was concretized as part of the curriculum. And then it finishes with a thesis, which allows you to really explore a topic that is of great interest to you in a one-on-one -on -one setting with an academic advisor. And so I'll just share a few details about that curriculum. You heard already that you can use your electives if you concentrate them in a specific set of courses to gain expertise in one of these three areas of concentration, which is noted as part of your degree and which is something that often is viewed as an additional credential to the Master of Liberal Arts. And so 
You can really focus on ethics and leadership as Beth has described. Um, if you're interested in literary studies, it's an opportunity to go deep into literature and great books. And then for tech and society, this is a new concentration that is bringing the latest tools of the university to look at this intersection, which is a growing and both hugely opportunistic and hugely concerning one that we thought we should devote more of our intellectual assets to, including in our transformative education. In terms of theses, I just share here on the screen, and I'll ask um, Tim and Beth about this a little bit more, some examples of the types of theses that people have built. And the reason we show these is just to show the diversity that has come out just in the last few theses projects. And that reflects that individuals are really bringing together a lot of their own life experience and interest with the novel ideas and intellectual assets of the university. And so it's a great way for you, if there's something you've wanted to investigate, to have an opportunity to do that in a setting with real guidance and support. I also want to talk briefly about the really distinct character of a U Chicago classroom. And you see some of the attributes here. You have faculty that are skilled facilitators. They are there to actually engage in Socratic conversation. We do hold them over Zoom, although I want to make clear that there are some online programs that are asynchronous and where you're either on a recording or in a big room. Um, we are exactly the opposite. Um, this is actually a larger room than we would allow for any of our classrooms because we cap all classes at 20. And I think Beth will speak to this. We overwhelmingly end up at 12 to 15, which is our target, uh, because we want everyone to be a contributor as well as a learner. And even though you're on Zoom for most of your classes, and we'll talk about the residential seminar, which is an alternative, um, you are in a room where you are a huge part of the wisdom and the interaction. And so we find that that really has a different experience than what you might hear about in other online forums. And it's part of our DNA as a university that we believe that knowledge happens when people are interacting. And indeed, one of the contributors to this who I uh, just so admire, Mortimer Adler has a great quote that a lecture has a habit of going from the notes of the professor to the notes of the student without ever being in the mind of either. And he talks all about the need for everything to happen in an interactive form where you're not conveying knowledge, you're discovering together. And that really is the ethos and belief system that we aim to have in our classes with our exchange of ideas. And then a final viewpoint at the university, which is very strong, is that all viewpoints are welcome. And you may know that we have been relentless in our commitment to free expression and to the idea that if you can marry free expression and diversity of perspective, you can come through joint inquiry to better ideas. And it is one of the reasons that we are proud to have 97 Nobel Prize winners associated with this university, that we are a place that supports and encourages unconventional thinking and breakthrough ideas. And I'll just share that those are the faculty that you will be in the classroom with. This is a program where we have our faculty that are teaching the program. These are tenured faculty that are eminent scholars. But the reason that they elect to teach at Graham and that we select them for the honor of being part of the Master of Liberal Arts is because they are deeply committed to lifelong learning and they believe powerfully in transformative education. And so these are people that are eminent scholars, but also gifted educators. Uh, with that, I'll just mention that if you are wondering how you could be on that beautiful campus that you saw earlier, in addition to the online format, which is the dominant way that people pursue their Master of Liberal Arts, there is an option that you can take each September, which is the autumn quarter, and each spring quarter, where you can be part of a residential seminar and accomplish a full course in the context of a week with a little bit of pre-work and a little bit of post-work. And it means that you can be in person for that course. And regardless of where you are in the world, if you come here for that week, you can complete it. And alongside the coursework itself, there are many opportunities to participate in the life of the university over that week. And so you'll see coming up this September, we have Ken Warren, who is one of the most eminent professors in English literature, uh, teaching a really interesting course that will be on the pivotal decade, 1970s literature and the rise of inequality. 
Uh, it will actually poke some fun at our own university because at this time, Milton Friedman is popularizing an idea related to capitalism. And at the same time, many people in literature are using literature to question that idea. And so he will be exploring that through that decade. And part of his interest is that he believes many of these ideas continue to be very relevant uh, to literature and economics today. Uh, and with that, I'll just mention that we have many supports. So um, we know the University of Chicago can seem intimidating. Uh, we really want to make sure that everyone who joins this program is successful and thrives. And part of that we go through in the admissions process to, in our interview and other things, make sure that this is something that you all are serious about before you join. Uh, if you are, what we are committed to is making sure that you're going to be successful in this program. And that includes academic advising that is top-notch, writing support by a woman, Millie Ray, who I think is someone who I constantly learn from about writing and how to do it better. Uh, and then you have many access points. You have library, obviously you become a full student, so you have access to all of our uh, UChicago grad and alumni resources and the incredible networks of a world-class university. Uh, but enough from me. Uh, we are here with two people that actually have experienced this. And so Beth, I wanna start again with you. Uh, you're now halfway through the program as we discussed, and we'd love to hear about your journey and what this educational experience is like for you. And also you mentioned this a little bit earlier, who else is in the classroom with you? Yeah, and it's, uh, I guess to start with um, the classroom experience, um, as, as you mentioned, it's, uh, it is, it's, an, it's a great size. And it's so funny, um, I did a, 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 a climate and pollution class, which is relevant for today. Um, and the professor said, it's like a group of friends sitting around and talking. It's much more than that, um, but it's, it's a topic that I know people were nervous about coming in because one of the things that you do is you read scientific papers and you have to talk about them. You have to distill the information. And from the beginning, you're a little nervous about doing that, but by the end, you're having, pretty, you're having very in-depth conversations about pretty uh, expansive topics that, that you didn't know anything about before but in a way where you're, you're supporting your, your peers and the fact of having this, this conversation. Um, and I, the one thing, there's just so much diversity in the group in terms of their professions, their backgrounds. Um, but the one thing that they all come to, I think what you mentioned earlier is the curiosity and the yeah. way that they support each other. Um, the digital ethics residential seminar and your point about coming on campus. And I also, um, and to the point of the support of the group, um, Tim and uh, Kaylee and everybody, they're just, um, they just really help you figure out what's going to be best for you. And I took a class on campus and actually, you know, was, you know, came and just really experienced it. And I think being part of the community, I mean, I'm, I'm somebody that like signs up for every newsletter. And if you do that at the university of Chicago, you'll just be, I mean, from every, um, every various different center and going to, to class, you know, to sessions and being part of the community and every day I'll say, Oh, that's really interesting. Just in the, 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 the daily news or whenever the weekly newsletter. Um, so, it's it's that immersion and that of just making you think and how, and exposing you to things that you didn't know before. Um, you know, I, I mentioned my apocalypse class. I mean, one of the things we had to, you know, we read that from the perspective of revelations from, from that perspective. And it's just something you never would have done before. Yeah. Um, and, and you know, you you do assignments that, that augment that. And then um, the professors are just so helpful. You, I think you'd used a term of facilitators. And they, they have this group of people that are so thoughtful and, and really um, have varied thinking, but they also pull everybody together and, and, and make the point to where we're trying to go. So that, from that perspective, it's just been incredible. And, and you know, the classes go so fast. You're like, oh my gosh, I can't believe it's already over. It's a quarter goes so fast, but then the evening as well. Um, I just, I'll tell you, it's, it's one of the best things I've ever done. It is just so... Um, it's just fun to learn. And I mean, I think that's the other thing that people are learners to your point, they're lifelong learners and they just like the, uh, ex the feeling of, of knowledge and being immersed in it. Well, and that is a beautiful, I think, you know, endorsement of the type of classroom. And I, I mean, Tim, anything you wanna add on what makes the classroom here distinctive? I, I think we've, we've done a pretty thorough, uh, thorough job of, uh, of Covering it, I would uh, I would just reemphasize the point that uh, the classrooms are, are run as uh, conversation among peers. 
Uh, and our students learn just as much from each other as they do from uh, the eminent faculty member teaching it because the students come from different backgrounds and different prior trainings and different ways of thinking. Um, and uh, that diversity of, uh, of mindsets in a room thinking about the same problem uh, results in really enriching conversations. Um, and the other point that I would uh, just reemphasize again is that the faculty, as a result of these wonderful conversations that are happening around the seminar table or the Zoom room, uh, the faculty are just as eager to be a part of uh, that learning experience as, as the students are. Um, often we have more faculty who uh, express interest in teaching than we have slots for them in a, in a given year because word's gotten out that MLA students are, are bringing fresh perspectives to, uh, to these topics. Um, and the faculty often have so much fun with, with teaching MLA students that they'll, uh, they'll use an MLA classroom to test drive a new topic or a new idea or a book project uh, that they want to get uh, a diverse set of uh, opinions on before they um, before they execute on that. Uh, and I can think of a couple examples off the top of my head that uh, uh, underscore that point. But uh, I think that uh, I think that as a result of the wonderful faculty and, and of course again the, the community of peers, the, uh, the classroom is a real magical place. And as Neil, I'll just echo what Tim mentions here because I get lobbied regularly by faculty. <laughs> who want to be able to teach. And a lot of times it's because they see a real mutuality with their own work. So I'm thinking of Peggy Mason, who's writing a trade press book. And you know she's written a lot of incredible, eminent journal articles and you know books for the scientific community. Uh, but who she's really aiming toward in this new endeavor is a kind of really informed and educated public that are generalists. And that is, the MLA audience, because you know, you're know you not necessarily a neuroscientist when you take the MLA. So how can she bring these ideas in an accessible way to a really smart audience, right? And so that happens all the time where you know faculty see this really as an incredible opportunity because they may be domain experts and teach graduate level in their own areas where they're with students who have all these prerequisites, but they actually engage and embrace the challenge of how do I bring these ideas to a really smart group, but that isn't with all of these prerequisite knowledge for, you know, my physical sciences or biological sciences. And um, I took that. Yeah, go I for it. Class, I put that, I took that class last quarter. Oh, and yeah. the way that she did that too, is that uh, and you made a point about, you know, there, there's a syllabus and a frame of articles and it's not, you know, it's a, it's a manageable amount of reading and that, but she, it, it went the way uh, the progressed, the class did cl each class progressed a bit. And then she, also your point of afterwards asking us to get involved in really understanding her and her uh, graduate assistant that was working with her as well, Silas, about really just immersive into their research. And it really pulls it all together what you're trying to accomplish at the university. Well, so I'll make this last question for you both a power round question, because I know we want to get to the audience questions and then we'll come back to you both. Um, I know you Chicago can seem intimidating and Beth, I'm curious if you could just speak to how it felt to come back to the classroom after decades uh, and uh, do so at a place like U Chicago, and whether or not the supports of the MLA were helpful in making that possible for you. Yeah, it was um, the first class. It was hard to, I mean, the point of um, making sure that, you know, you wanted to, that you were uh, prepared, I guess. And that's the one thing, the other thing is that people come prepared. I mean, all the people do their readings. So it's, it's uh, that you, um, you know, just feeling comfortable, especially in that first class. And I think, I think maybe Tim mentioned about confidence um, and understanding that you're going to be, you're not going to know, you're going to, you're going to be feel uncomfortable. And I think that's, I think the team gets you ready, Tim and team and others, they, you know, and get you ready to understand that. And then the other students are there to support you. I mean, everybody's in the same boat. And you don't really know that right away at the first class, but as you talk to people and especially as you go progress throughout the quarter, especially your first quarter and the professor, I mean, I, I had the um, op opportunity at my first course um, with Professor Miller, where he just was there. And to your point of um, if you wanted to, you know, have an offline Zoom call or had a question or the papers, the writing, the writing resource or you know, um, asking the, you know, the other team just to be there. So you, you feel supported hundred percent and that's the best part of it. Well, Tim, any uh, final ads? Uh, for such a writing intensive program, uh, we have incredible writing support in the form of Millie Ray, the uh, writing advisor. 
uh, running advisor doesn't even scratch the surface of uh, of the services Millie offers. She's more of a, a research consultant, and uh, I mean, she'll do the writing. She'll look at papers with you too, and, and nuts and bolts of, of grammar. But uh, she helps you conceptualize the structure of your paper, and when it comes time for the thesis project at the end, uh, Millie's there to to help you figure out what you're interested in and, and the way to frame it, and the research research uh, tools available, and uh, how to communicate your ideas and your findings and um, Millie's, uh, Millie's a real uh, b uh, benefit to the program. Well, so we're going to come back to you for Q&A, but I'm going to turn it over now to my colleague, Carrie Dempsey, who is our leader for recruitment because we have some upcoming deadlines for those who are interested in joining us as early as this fall. Uh, Carrie? Yeah, thanks, Seth. Um, so after hearing all about this wonderful program, I'm sure you're eager to find out when is your next opportunity to begin it. And um, our next uh, intake is this autumn uh, on September 26. The application deadline for that is September 7th. However, I know that sounds very far away, um, but there are quite a few steps in the application process. So we heavily encourage you to start the application soon. If you wait until September or late August to start this process, it's unlikely that you will be able to complete it by then. Um, and as we look at the application process, um, the first item is a writing sample. Uh, the writing sample is about a five page document that we look for. And a lot of people use something that maybe they've written in another academic setting or um, in their professional lives, sometimes a report that you wrote for work. Um, we're willing to look at that to let you know if it will work for the application process or not. So you're welcome to send that to the admissions team and we'll provide you feedback. If it's determined you don't have something readily available that you can use, um, some people will write a review of a play that they saw or a movie that they liked. So there are other options as well. Uh, the candidate statement is an incredibly important element of the application process. It allows us to understand why this program and, and, and what it means to you. So anytime you might have saved by repurposing something for the writing sample, we really encourage you to take that time and use it for your candidate statement. Um, two letters of recommendation are necessary, um, either academic or professional. Uh, sometimes um, it can take a little bit for those to come in. So if you're thinking about applying for the program, start having those conversations right now with people who may um, be willing to do this recommendation for you. And then uh, transcripts are needed from every university that you attended. So even if you've completed a, a master's level program, we will also need those transcripts for your undergraduate experience. We'll also need a copy of your resume. Um, if you don't meet the English proficiency requirements, uh, you will need to submit those test scores. We do have a $75 application fee, but because all of you have joined the session tonight, we are willing to waive that for you. So just reach out to the team and we'll waive, for that, waive that in your application. And then once you submit your application, uh, we will reach out to you to schedule an interview. And during that interview, you'll meet with uh, Tim and a graduate of the program. And it's not a test of you know, your knowledge of liberal arts. This is more just getting to know you better, further understanding why you feel this program is a good fit for you, and maybe asking any questions that weren't clear in your application. And then um, in terms of tuition and financial aid, um, a few things I wanted to highlight. One is that there are some merit scholarships available. Uh, we encourage you to submit your application as early as possible if you do want to be considered for those. Uh, federal financial aid can be used for the program if you are taking two or more courses in any given quarter. If you are looking to take just one course in a quarter, you can explore uh, private loans for that. And then we heavily encourage all of our students to um, explore if their employer offers tuition reimbursement benefits. So many organizations offer them and people don't know that they're there. So if you're, you're thinking about the program and you're admitted to the program, please reach out to your HR teams to understand that better. Well, so we have come to the moment that we have long promised, which is questions. And so I'm gonna stop sharing this screen uh, so that we can see all of you. And we are eager to answer your questions. Uh, there are 
at least three ways that you can endeavor your question. Uh, one is that in the chat, you can feel free to put in your question. Two is that if you raise your hand using the reactions tab, so if you press on that reactions in your bottom right hand corner and then press raise hand, um, we can call on you. And a third, because uh, we uh, really want this to be interactive is um, please uh, unmute yourself if you're so inclined and, um, and, and just begin your question. And uh, I see Lee, you may be unmuted. Uh, is that a sign of a, of a question? Uh, well, that was pretty bold of me, but uh, since I'm called on, I'll ask a question. Um, I, I wanted to talk about the, um, the, the emphasis, the three options on, on emphasis and, you know, kind of the merits of that. Um, you, you know, I, I guess, um, was I interpreting correctly that if you were going to do, you know, the literary emphasis, all your electives would be in literary or how, how does that work sort of, you know, procedurally? Yeah, I mean, Tim, do you want to start on that? <clears throat> yeah, you're, you're right. So uh, to pursue a concentration, you take your, your three general electives and you focus them in, in coursework that we've pre-designated as counting toward uh, toward one of those electives. So um, the, the plus and minuses to, uh, to, to doing a concentration or just doing the normal uh, degree, there's, uh, uh, I think, an obvious upside to some cohesion to, to your coursework and, and focusing on a, an area that uh, is of particular interest to you. Um, but uh, also the, uh, an upside to doing, uh, leaving your, your general electives to pursue whatever happens to be most interesting in any given quarter. Um, Beth's doing uh, ethics and leadership. And uh, do, you, do you find that um, uh, that's limited your ability to pursue other, other interests in the program? No, because, because not at all. Because my, with uh, first of all, your core classes are, are, are so much variety. Um, but then my, I've taken two, I think the, the digital ethics class I took and then I did a leadership class. That's a nice thing you can look across the university and for your electives, take classes in other, other areas. So I took one in the, in the business school. Um, but I, 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 rest, I had that balance too, like, cause I'm interested in so much. I think that's the thing is like, there's just so many things to choose from. How do you, you know, limit it? So I, I feel it's been a good mix of, you know, being able to within the, the core classes, being able to get a variety of different pro classes and across the board and then, and then finding a little bit to concentrate on. And I'll just add on a theory side, um, the way that we think about this degree is that it's a deep investigation and that it allows you to look at major intersections in society. And so ethics and leadership is one example. It is something that is across so many different domains, right? Every industry, every different way of looking at the world look at tech and society as well, right? There is every part of our lives that's shaped by it. And the reason I share that is because what that means is that there are a lot of variations and course opportunities that fit within these concentrations. So it's much more open-ended than if you were to say be an accounting major or concentration. And you know there's a very set uh, need for you to get a certain technical skill. And so even within the concentration, there is a pretty significant uh, an expansive scope that you can still engage with. It doesn't mean that you don't have choices to make as a result, but it doesn't limit your choices as much as it may in some other majors or concentration experiences. Um, I see a question in the chat. Um, how many course options are available within a concentration each quarter? And I know, Tim, that part of that is what we offer. And then part um, to what Beth spoke to is that you can take up to two classes um, in the rest of the university. So, and then some of those can be designated toward the concentrations, but I'll, I'll let you share more. Yes, I, I think in any given quarter um, for each concentration, there's, there's at least one uh, course option. Uh, this autumn will have two for be the two choices for uh, ethics and leadership. Uh, and because it is an interdisciplinary program, uh, sometimes uh, one class could count for, for two different concentrations. So an example of that was last winter, uh, we had a class taught by a classicist named David Ray. It was called World Wisdom Literature. Um, and it, it, looked, it looked for lessons of leadership uh, in some of the great ancient texts. Uh, but because a lot of those, all those texts had, um, were uh, literature in nature, that also counted for the literary studies concentration. 
other questions that you may have, uh, feel free to raise your hand or just unmute and ask. Um, I had maybe a pedestrian question, but I was uncertain about it. Yeah. Sort of the pacing. So you take nine courses and, you know, if I'm working full time and maybe doing three courses to do it in a year, every term would be a heavy lift. Can I take one course and sort of spread it out over three years or maybe take a summer and do it in two and a quarter years? How does that work? Absolutely. Yeah. So the range goes from one to five years, depending on how you want to pace. It's at your discretion. And that is most of all, because we know people are very busy and want to be able to accomplish this alongside their lives. Um, I also want to acknowledge that an additional benefit of this for those who have employer reimbursement is that you can spread it based on that employer willingness to pay. So there are some people in the program who get you know, five or $7,500 or $10,000 a year, and then they spread their degree so that it can be fully covered uh, by their employer. So um, it is at a pace that allows you to choose. It also means for those who are really ambitious and willing to give up their weeknights or, you know, weekend morning, uh, that you can accomplish this in uh, a three academic quarter year. So that is possible, although we recommend you know, going at a pace that really allows you to get the full value, which if you're working full time would typically mean um, some level of a multi-year process. But I mean, Tim, Beth, anything to add? Yeah, I've done it. Uh, I've kind of done it a bit aggressively. Um, and I, taking, you know, taking two classes a quarter is, is it's, it's, uh, it's do definitely doable, um, especially with the residential seminar. Um, but to your point, taking one class is a nice pace because then you can really immerse in it more, more than you're not, you know, like, oh, I got to do that assignment now. So I, I, I think um, doing it at your own pace and changing. That's another thing is that like I had signed up for one quarter. I signed up for two classes. I'm like, no, this is too much. And then um, with the help of the team, able to kind of scale back and just take one. So just the, the flexibility is really a, a really important you know, component of being able to do this program. And I've looked at other ones and that's just the ability to you know, fit it into your life and your life changes. That's the other thing too, is something you can get into like, okay, this is not working. And, and, and really, just like I said, the support of the group, the team is really, I can't speak highly enough of that because it really, it really is an important part of it. Uh, Tim, there's a question here that I'm going to direct to you from Patrick. How do tests and grading work? Are individual presentations required throughout the program? As Dean, I'll just share one thought on grading, which is I am one of the few deans at the university who never gets called by a parent uh, because they are upset <laughs> their kids' grades. Uh, so that is uh, one of the blessings of uh, being with people at this stage of, of life. But I'll let Tim answer the hard question here. Uh, so grading is almost always uh, on written work. Um, so there'll be at least a, a term for each class. There'll be one term paper due at the end. That's 10 or 11, 12 double spaced pages. Um, I don't think that there are tests, although Beth mentioned she was in that climate pollution class. And the first year the professor taught that, he had an open book test. Um, so it was, uh, we're, not, we're not after trivia or memorization of, or, uh, of, of, of facts, but uh, conceptually thinking about the facts and synthesizing information that is best expressed in, in writing. So at a bare minimum, you'll have a term paper due uh, at the end of each quarter. Um, and occasionally there'll be smaller writing assignments throughout. And I think individual presentations, um, maybe about a third of the classes have some kind of presentation element uh, to them. Uh, I also just want to quickly address uh, another question I saw that Scott asked uh, about course schedule times. Uh, in the evenings, weeknights, Monday through Thursday evenings, 6.30 to 9.30 Chicago time. Um, and there's also a Saturday morning classes, 9.30 to 12.30 um, uh, in, in the morning. Um, but if you take a class, it meets on the same day of the week at the same time for a 10-week span. It goes so fast, too. You think 6.30 to 9.30, that's going to be really long, but there's a break in the middle, and it's just a, just, it flies. Uh, Paul Escobar, we see your question next. Uh, yes, thank you, um, Professor or Dean. Uh, I have a question for uh, uh, Beth. Beth, on average, what was your writing load like assuming you take one course per quarter, like on a weekly basis, did you have to, for example, did you have to send a paper and or submit a paper or some comments every week or how did that work out? It just varied. Um, like example, the neurobiology class, you had to do a, a, like a 300 word, just a response, um, like what you learned from, you know, your readings. 
Um, and then um, in the, you know, so, so not a lot of writing throughout. I mean, just sometimes just responsive. And you mentioned about the climate class, you had to, it wasn't really a test, but you had to kind of write, you know, open book to what you learned in that certain area. So not, and then in the end, um, like the, I think the, the apocalypse paper was maybe like eight or nine pages. And then the other one was like 10 or 12 page, 15 pages. So, but at the end, but throughout the week, not a lot of writing. Um, it's more, it was reading, but not too much. I mean, it wasn't overwhelming amounts. Some were, some classes had like a literature class had a bit more. Josh, we see your hand. All right, can you hear me? Yep, we hear you. Okay, um, I was wondering, uh, do you get to use the Gleacher Center as a student at the University of Chicago? Well, I mean, you have access to any of our buildings. Uh, there's maybe less that's actually from a resource perspective at Gleacher uh, than on our Hyde Park campus where like the big libraries and access to different resources may be. But yes, certainly Gleacher is, you know, one of the buildings of the university and you're a full student. Of you know, because you know that little waiting room to the left that you go in when you first get in the door, there's like a lounge in there with coffee and stuff sometimes. Oh yeah, yeah, no, so I mean, any uh, building, uh, you're absolutely welcome and you know, you can use those to study in and you will receive a university ID and, and all of those aspects of being a university student. Is, is the bus shuttle still working too? Cause I haven't seen them lately, like running like water, like it used to be. <laughs> I don't know if it's just, I haven't been over there every day. Well, so. Summer now they're lower, but, but during the academic year, absolutely. Yeah, they're um, running actively um, and I mean, the course is overwhelmingly for this degree will be online. So you wouldn't necessarily need that to get to class, uh, but the residential seminar is in person. And then there are certainly a lot of gatherings uh, that you might want to come to Hyde Park for that are very available to you as a student. So are those residential seminars, are those, is, is that what we use the bus shuttle for to get there and back every day? You certainly that could. Be that? Okay, you could. Okay, okay. And I see, um, Raymond Spencer, you have a question about the experience of students that enter the program following undergrad. Uh, and that is rare, but it does happen. And I mean, Tim, I don't know if you want to talk to that example. Uh, it, it, it is rare. Um, and the, uh, the students that do um, follow that route usually have, uh, usually art articulate a, a rationale for, for doing it so quickly out of undergrad. Uh, so an example would be somebody who studied um, business or finance as an undergrad and didn't have an opportunity to explore uh, the humanities or the social sciences. So they come to us to try and round out that, uh, to try and round out the um, uh, the, the prior education. Uh, and that, that would be uh, the first, uh, first example that comes to mind. I see a question here from Scott Dawson about how many students are from outside Chicago. Uh, and Carrie, I'll turn it over to you because I know you actually have that data. I do. About a third of our students come from the Chicagoland area. So um, we do see students come from really all over the world. So we have about two thirds of our learners who are admitted to the program come from elsewhere, either across the United States, but we also have them come from other countries. We had uh, students uh, from, from a couple of students from China, which was really interesting perspectives on, you know, we had the climate conversations. It really uh, expands the conversation, but from California, just really, that was a great thing about it. Well, I was fascinated in the American democracy class that Marco Garrido uh, taught that he had a number of students that were elsewhere in the world during that class. And uh, it was just after January 6th and they were talking about how it paralleled some of the things that were happening in Chile or other places. And so I was struck and I know he was too by as a you know teacher, just being in a classroom where he was learning so much from his students and their alternative context to American democracy. Uh, we have appeared to have, have fulfilled the, the questions. Uh, I also noticed that it is exactly seven. So um, the timing almost seems too perfect. Um, let me just offer uh, maybe Beth, because uh, we're so grateful for you being here alongside your busy schedule and schoolwork. Any uh, parting comment for everyone here, Beth, uh, as they think about this opportunity? 
I mean, I said this before, it hands down the best thing, one of the best things I've ever done. I mean, I, I think about my, in my career, my MBA was, you know, changed the trajectory of my career in a significant way, but I think the MLA program has changed the trajectory of my life. I mean, it really, um, I'm at a stage in my life where I want, you know, I want to learn in different ways and have different experiences. And I, I can't, I can't even like tell you how much this has meant to me at this point. And I, I am so grateful and of my classmates and my professors, the team that puts it all together. Um, you know, I'm happy to share more about it. And I just, I can't even say like, again, it's changed my life. Well, thank you so much for being here. Thank you all for being part of this. Um, we really do want to be the place where life-changing transformative education happens. Uh, we believe the university has immense resources and our role at Graham is to make sure people can really value them and be a part of them throughout their lives. So uh, thank you for being part of our intellectual community tonight. And we look forward to continuing the conversation with all of you. Have good evenings, everyone. Thank you.